Well, I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Pastor Justin Stewart. Some of you maybe have met me and you would remember me from the past. Well, welcome back. Uh, those of you who are new, welcome here for the first time. Um, it is a great privilege to be coming to you once again. Even though I am uh, far away, our hearts are with you. And I just want to thank you guys for this opportunity for us to, to teach you, uh, even from a distance. We thank the Lord for the great technology. And I just want to make you aware that there are some changes that are going to be coming in the future, but they're good changes, some improvements to the curriculum. And as those developments are available, I will uh, talk to you, uh, give you some training about it, maybe some more videos, and uh, we'll look forward to that when the time comes. Um, so in the meantime, I just want to say welcome, and we're going to start this class. I'm going to give you a little introduction uh, to our textbook. I'm going to just kind of go through that with you now. So let's jump in. Well, hello again. Um, so we're looking now at the book. This is uh, a PDF or an electronic version of your textbook here. It's called Hermeneutics, Keys for Interpreting Scriptures. And I just want to give you a little overview of it uh, so you're familiar with it as we go through the course. Dr. Paul Karam is our author, and he was my teacher in Bible school. Very godly man. He understands and knows the Word of God like very few people I've ever met. Um, so you're going to have hopefully a printed copy of this book. It is necessary for this course for you to read this textbook in its entirety and go through the questions. I'll show you the questions. But first of all, we're going to just do a little, here's the table of contents, a little introduction. Uh, so there's an introduction, part one. Uh, part two are personal rules for the interpreter himself. Part three are principles for interpreting the scriptures. And we're going to spend most of our time in this class on these first three points. Um, number three, we're going to spend the majority of our time in. The first few sessions will be in uh, this uh, number two here. But the rest of the book, the keys for opening up the Old Testament and the keys for opening up the New Testament, you're going to find that that is actually a survey of the entire Bible. And it's going to take the principles that we learn in the first few sessions and then show you how to apply them to every book of the Bible. Now, in our class that we have together, we don't have enough time together to go through every single book of the Bible. So we're going to spend most of our time on points one, two, and three. And then I'm going to just sort of pick and choose a few uh, from uh, the different books of the Old Testament and the New Testament. But then you are going to be required to read the book on your own. And then if you continue to study with us later on, we're actually going to have course on Old Testament survey and New Testament survey. And you'll use this book in addition to another textbook for that class. So I just wanted to give you a little overview. There's 233 pages. This is one of those books that you buy and you keep on your bookshelf and you keep forever. I recommend when you're preaching, when you're, you know, if you're preaching at your church, you're preparing your sermons, this is one of those go-to resources again and again and again. I have re I took this class, you know, more than 15 years ago, and I have returned to this course, this, this textbook, again and again and again throughout the years. So buy this book, uh, keep it on your shelf, and return to it often. It's extremely, extremely important. So uh, we're going to get into it here in a minute, but I just want to show you also... So another requirement for your course is this, this test. So this test is an open book test. That means you're going to have this book, your textbook open. You're going to have this test with you as you're reading through. Now, I recommend that you read through the textbook and you look up all the scriptures. But 
while you're reading through it, you can have this this test with you, and it's going to be a fill in the blank. You're going to fill in the answers uh, based on what you read, and it does go in order. Like you're going to find the questions go in order of the reading, so you're not going to be having to jump around to find your answers. Okay, so it's mostly fill in the blank. There might be some circling, uh, mostly fill in the blank, and it, it tells you, you know, you can see here. Um, like right here, you can see that it tells you where you're going to find these answers, like under this section three, principles for interpreting scripture. So you, you'll be able to see um, where the answers are from, okay? So it is a fairly long test, but it, it if you go through it while you're reading it, it's not going to take you a long time. There are 200 questions, and it is going to take you through the entire book so remember, like I said, we're going to read the entire book on your own, go through this test. But in our lectures together, we're not going to go through every single page of this book together. Okay, so that's a little introduction to our textbook. And now we're going to uh, dive in and start talking about the subject at hand of hermeneutics. Well, welcome to our study on hermeneutics. This is one of my favorite courses. Uh, Dr. Karam was a spiritual father, is a spiritual father to me. And in, in my courses in Bible school, he's the one who really made a difference in my heart and my life as he taught. And the Lord used him to really bless me. So he's the author of our, of our textbook. He's the creator of this course. Uh, and it's just such a privilege to be able to teach his course. And I've had the privilege of teaching it in a number of places. But this will be my first time doing it in this format with a pre-recorded lecture and with this slideshow. So I will also make the slides available to you. The PowerPoint slides will be made available to you. Um, so see Pastor Zimba, the facilitator of the course, um, to receive those. Or you can always reach out to me. and. Um, I will include my email on one of these slides so that you can email me if you need to ask me any questions. Or you want to ask me directly, uh, that would work. So here I will include my, here's an email you can reach uh, me directly, zionfellowshipzambia at gmail.com. Actually, that would be a great way to interact with me. Um, you could ask me questions, or good, another good way is through my WhatsApp. Uh, if you do plus one for the country code, 917-983-0004, and connect with me on WhatsApp. We also have a Facebook page, which you can message me, uh, Zion Fellowship Zambia. And here, I'll actually just show you a little... A little picture of that page here if I can find it real quick and then um, if you reach out to me that way then we can interact a little bit with this class so here's Facebook page is on Fellowship Zambia this is what it looks like and I do post some other things on here from time to time other messages and other classes and things that I have taught on different places and there's even some pictures of us uh, in Zambia when we uh, had our first uh, classes in Avondale so uh, so that's good ways to get in touch with me so without further ado let's jump into hermeneutics so what is hermeneutics hermeneutics is a fancy word and as you can see it ends in ICS X right Anytime there's a word that ends in ix, like homolytics or hermeneutics, it's referring to a science of some kind. So hermeneutics, it is actually the science of interpretation. Specifically, we're looking at the science of interpreting scripture. Uh, the word of God, it's going to help us. Hermeneutics is going to help us to know what the meaning is of the author's words and phrases that he uses or who they use. And it's going to help us to be able to explain 
the actual meaning behind the words and phrases of the scriptures and explain them to other people. It's very important. You know, when it comes to communication, there's often a gap between the sender of a message and the receiver of the message. Now, there's a lot of things that can present challenges or prevent that message from being properly received and understood or properly given from the sender. So there could be problems on both sides, from the sender side or from the receiver side. And hermeneutics is actually going to seek to bridge that gap. Hermeneutics seeks to bridge the gap between the sender who is God and the authors, the writers that he used to write the scriptures, and the receiver of the message is mankind, you and I and those whom we seek to reach. And one of the challenges to interpretation is the fact that God used 40 different authors from all walks of life over a period of 2,000 years, and he used three different languages. So there are some things uh, that can create problems <laughs> for understanding. And so we're going to go through some of these things. We're going to talk about them. Here's a number of factors that can affect uh, the interpretation, the message being received. And so we're going to try to go through some of these. Like, culture. You know, you living in Africa and I, uh, having grown up in the United States, we have different cultures. And there, when I lived there with you, um, there were sometimes things that I didn't understand about your culture. And it's the same with scripture. There are some cultural things in the Bible, uh, in the Jewish way of doing things that are different from the way that we do. And so it helps if we understand some of that, it'll help us to get the true message that is being delivered. Uh, the way they dress, the manners, the different customs, translations. Sometimes translations of the Bible um, make it difficult for us to understand what the original language was trying to give us. You know, especially many of us grew up, uh, myself included, I grew up learning the King James Version of the Bible. Well, a lot of those words we don't use anymore. They're obsolete words. There could be poor pronouns or verbs and tenses that are just different than they were then. They don't translate well from the original Hebrew or the, or the original Greek into the English language or Nyanja or whatever language it is that you speak or read in. Uh, we have to understand that there is a difference between interpretation and application. Those are not the same thing. You know, you can make many different applications to your life or the life of your congregation um, from a certain passage of Scripture, but it doesn't make it the same as the interpretation of that. We need to understand or a factor that can affect our interpretation is the difference between natural versus spiritual meanings. Some things have a natural meaning, some have a spiritual meaning, some have both. Super, super important is the context of which something is written. We'll give you many examples of this as we go. Wrong context can make something an error. We need to know when to apply the different principles. I'm going to teach you through this course, I believe it's eight, seven or eight general overriding principles of interpretation. And you have to know when to apply each one of those principles. Furthermore, to whom the message was intended is important to understand if a message is intended for the Jews or if it was intended for the Greeks. Or for the Romans, it makes a difference in how something was written. And we'll talk about this. You know, there's a passage in Matthew where there is this little phrase, except for fornication, where Jesus, he basically says it's, a, it's adultery to be divorced and then to marry somebody else's adultery, except for the cause of fornication. But that's only found in Matthew. So it's possible, and we'll talk about this later, that that particular message of Matthew was mostly being 
given to the Jews, whereas Mark is written to the Romans, and Luke is written to the Greeks. So there's different wording there's, that makes a difference in the receiving of the message. The calendar is different in the Bible. They had a agricultural calendar and a religious calendar that doesn't line up the same with ours. Their years only had 355 days, if I'm not mistaken. Ours current uh, in our modern times is 365. Climate, seasons, agriculture, these things are important to understand if we're going to understand things like the former rain or the latter rain or the hasty fruit. These things are going to help us and enrich our understanding of the scriptures. Some Eastern expressions like gird up the loins. You know, if we don't know what that means when Peter says to gird up the loins of your mind, we're not going to understand what on earth is he talking about. So if we understand that phrase, it's going to make sense. Uh, dispensations and covenants. You know, there are different, uh, if I could say this, different rules that apply during different dispensations of time in Scripture. And if we need to know if something applies to us, if it applies to the time of the law or the time of the age of grace, um, for like polygamy and different things like that, we have to understand. Uh, another thing that's important is the promise to natural Israel, or is it to the church, or is it to both? History or chronology, when an author lived and the events around him or her, their lives, it's very important to understand. It's going to enrich our understanding of the scriptures. It could be important to understand the circumstances in which a book was written. For example, Isaiah was written during the time of an Ass Assyrian invasion. You know, that could be important to know. Not all things that are written are to be taken at face value. We have to understand the, the context of the scripture. For example, Ecclesiastes. Solomon is writing that book when he is a backslidden, depressed preacher who is uh, reaping the fruit of a life that was lived in disobedience to everything that he taught. So when he says vanity of vanities, all is vanity, or that it, you know, it doesn't uh, help a person to be righteous, you know, you have to understand that message is not to be taken literally at face value because. It actually does profit a man to be righteous. And not all things are vanity of vanities. So we have to understand that. Understanding parables and allegories and types and shadows and patterns. These things can all greatly enrich our understanding of the scriptures. Geography. Numbers. The numbers all have a divine meaning. Colors have spiritual meaning. Names have a spiritual truth. There are spiritual terms like propitiation, atonement, and grace that need clarification and explanation. The feasts, like the offerings and the tabernacle of Moses and the tabernacle of David, the priestly garments, these all have present-day application and can be very enriching to understanding. Types. Every person in the scripture is a type of people that we see in the church today. And many of those people from the Old Testament, for example, are actually a type of Christ. So these are important things. And in this course, we're going to try to dive into these topics and others and explain all these things. We're going to attempt to create a set of standards or rules or guidelines that are going to help us to interpret and apply the word of God skillfully to our everyday lives and to in our context with you know whether you're a pastor or a youth leader we're going to try to give you some really good keys to help you as you go forth and teach the word of god and explain it to others amen so that's a little introduction in our next little section we're going to jump into a very important topic the personal rules for the interpreter 
You know, a lot of people think that when it comes to interpreting the scriptures, that they could just go to, you know, some seminary and they can learn all kinds of really cool principles and little tricks. And it's going to help them understand it. It's all up here in their head. But in reality, the biggest giant of interpreting scripture really is not, it's not an intellectual thing. It's not an intellectual battle, but it really is the need for a pure heart that's completely committed to the Lord. And before we can really understand scripture, we have to deal with ourselves, our personal heart, our motives, you know, what drives us. And so we're going to look at a few, there's actually quite a few rules that we're going to apply to ourselves as, as the one coming to the scriptures to interpret it. So we're going to look at 16 different um truths, 16 different things that need to happen in our own lives, 16 rules for our own life before we can really look at these other little keys to open up the scripture. So first of all, number one, the greatest need is a heart that is fully committed to God. This is the biggest giant to a good interpretation of the Bible. The need for a pure heart. Understanding is not a head issue. It is a heart issue. So when we come with pride or impure motives or moral impurity, these things, if allowed to continue, they will distort or twist our own understanding of Scripture. And then what will we teach to other people? We will teach a distorted or a twisted view of of scripture because something's not right in our own life. The issue is not ignorance. It's never been ignorance, but it is a heart that is not fully surrendered to the Lord. You know, the scripture is, is full of these, uh, of different examples of this. Uh, the issue is not about hearing the truth or even knowing the truth, but really, it's about loving the truth. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 10, the Apostle Paul talks about the coming Antichrist and his power to deceive others. In verse 10 it says, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure and unrighteousness. But back in verse 10 here, it says, they received not the love of the truth. You see, the deception now, this is specifically talking about the last days, but it can apply to any day. Deception is not because the truth cannot be known or we're not smart enough. It's not any of that. But it's because us people, they don't love the truth. There's something in their heart that still loves a lie. Men love darkness rather than the light. They didn't receive a love for the truth, but it is not because the truth is not available. Consider the Apostle Judas for a moment. I mean, this man did miracles. God used him to, to bring healing and, and cast out demons. He sat at the feet of the greatest teacher the world has ever known, but yet his heart was never changed. He had opportunity. He had greater opportunity than any of us have had to sit and to listen to the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. But the words of Jesus never sank down into his ears. As Luke 9, 44 says, where, he's, where Jesus says, Let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But the, the, the point there is, 
not just knowing the truth, not just hearing the truth, but letting it actually sink in and let us grab a hold of it and love it and embrace it with all of our hearts. The Apostle Judas is not in heaven today because he did not allow his heart to be changed by the truth that was given to him. We're also given the examples of the Pharisees, the scribes. You know, these men were like the PhDs or the, the THDs, the doctors of theology of their day. They had a deep understanding of, they spoke fluently the original languages of the Bible, especially Hebrew, but also the Greek. In the Lord's day, the Greek uh, had spread throughout the empire. It was a common language like English is today. But yet, they could not recognize the Word of God in the flesh, Jesus, standing in front of them, because their hearts were not fully committed. They had issues of pride, envy, jealousy, and they were competing with one another. And all of these things, these impurities in their heart, blocked them from a true understanding of the Scriptures. John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus rebukes them. He says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. Now it's this one here, I do not receive honor from men. That's going to be one of their their problems. They They cared more about the honor of men than they did about the honor of, that comes from God alone. So, the first, the first major issue here is a heart that is fully committed to God. Before you can understand anything, we're going to be committed fully to the Lord and His ways and His word. Secondly, it's not Greek, but it's grace. You know, pretty much every major seminary, at least in my country, they have a requirement that you take, you know, at least six credit hours or two semesters of Greek, two semesters of Hebrew. And you know what? That's actually not necessary. Although it can be enriching to study, it is not the most important key. Even the greatest, and I already mentioned this, about the theologians of Jesus' day. They had the languages. They spoke it fluently. They could read it. They had the original texts at their disposal. And so did a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. But yet, they couldn't see the Word of God made flesh. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the embodiment of all that they had studied for years and years. They didn't even recognize him when he came. And the same in our day. Some of the most intelligent people today, the greatest scholars of our day, theologians, they might even be, you know, spiritual, born again. But yet, they have major differences among themselves in their theology. They, they, they can read the original languages, but yet they still don't all have the same doctrine. And some of them even have bad doctrine. See, it's not Greek, but it's grace. It's the enlightenment that comes from Christ alone, from God alone, to open the heart and mind. It's, it's, a, it's a work of grace. It is a gift of grace that the Lord has got to give to us. Even Saul of Tarsus, I mentioned him. Uh, before he became the Apostle Paul, tradition tells us that he had the entire Old Testament memorized in both the Hebrew and the Greek Septuagint. Memorized, cover to cover. He could quote it. But yet, he was filled with murder and envy. And he was chasing after Christians, dragging them into prison, beating them up. See, something, there was a disconnect. So it's not Greek. But it's grace. You know, unless God sovereignly shines his light, no one can understand the true meaning. No one has the true interpretation. We see this in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, where it says, For it is 
the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's he commands a light to shine. It's an act of grace. Shines a light in our heart. Opens like a snapping of his fingers and allows people to understand. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 says, But their minds were blinded. Speaking of Israel, For until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. Verse 15, But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. See, this veil that's over our hearts and over our minds, it, it needs to be removed. It's taken away, not by study of Greek or cultivating our intellect through much study or much knowledge, but it's grace. Now listen, I want you to hear me. It is good to study. It is good to spend time studying the Word of God. And it can be useful to study Greek or Hebrew. But it's not the most important thing. Now these verses, certainly they apply to the new birth. And you know when God shines light, uh, just to come to salvation, to come to know the Lord for the first time. But this grace is also necessary to receive additional light, additional revelation as we move on in our walk with the Lord. We are totally and completely dependent on God for illumination. We can't work it up. We can't study it up. But it comes as a gift from God. Either he gives us the grace to understand and to perceive or he doesn't. It's completely his prerogative. You know, Proverbs 20, verse 12, tells us that the seeing ear, I'm sorry, the, the hearing ear, and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. You know, it is God who gives us the ability to see, both in the natural and in the spiritual. And it is the Lord who gives us the ability to hear, both naturally and and to hear his voice and to understand his ways. Amen. Thirdly, the third uh, rule for us as an interpreter in our personal lives, we need to have progressive light. In other words, we must continue growing in our understanding and our illumination of the Lord. And that it's also going to be coming. It's come, going to come as an act of grace. God's going to do it. But our light must increase. Now we have a little example of what I mean by this in the light of in the life of Isaiah the prophet. Now, and he was a seasoned prophet, but God saw that there was a need in his life, and he was going to illuminate something in his heart. It's going to reveal it. And after this experience that he has with the Lord, he actually comes to a higher place in ministry and he's going to have greater revelation even of the Lord's ministry um, in the second and the first coming of the Lord. And so it's necessary. Jesus is the source of light. And as we draw closer to him, we will see our own needs. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and in God's light, we can plainly see our real needs. As the chaos and the clutter are cleared away in our lives, then we can help bring enlightenment to other people too. And you know, there's a push in the world, but even in the church today, to turn to psychology for answers. And though I think psychology can maybe have some help in some situations, psychology really is a human light. It, it's not the same as the divine light. It takes a divine light from the Holy Spirit to locate the true root of our problems so that we can be healed. <clears throat> So we need to have a progressive light, progressive revelation of our own selves and 
where we are and our real needs. And sometimes this this is not an exciting an exciting situation, an exciting experience. Sometimes that increased light can feel depressing. But it's not meant to be that way. God provides us new light in an area of our need so that he can intervene in our lives and he can change us if we let him. We have to let him. We've got to let him work and do his work. Sometimes we have to be convinced of our wretched state before we can feel good about ourselves. <laughs> Amen. So number four, rules for the interpreter, is that truth is revealed to honest hearts only. And a lot of times the Lord in his teaching, he spoke in parables. And it's interesting because sometimes I read those, I'm like, Lord, why didn't you just plainly tell, you know, the people what you wanted them to know? But God had a reason. There was a purpose behind speaking in parables. And really what it was, was he would deliberately disguise the truth from those people who didn't really want to know it, who didn't have an honest heart. So they wouldn't be able to understand. And the Lord uh, insinuates this in Matthew 4, 11, when he says, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He's speaking to the disciples. Unto you it is known, it is given to know. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Amen. It's interesting that he purposefully disguised the truth from those who didn't really want to know it. You know, the Bible says again in Matthew eleven twenty-five 25, that God hides some deep spiritual truth from the wise and the prudent of this world. You know, those who are wise and prudent in their own eyes, and he reveals it unto babes. And I th I've always thought this was interesting. You know, some of the most intelligent most learned people, people with all these degrees and PhDs, but yet they have no faith, no understanding of, especially the creation of the world by an intelligent, loving creator God. Instead, they believe in evolution and all that we see happening by just random chances, random things happening, because the mysteries of God are hidden from the wise of this world and it's it's revealed to babes now to be a babe really is is someone who is innocent on one hand but also one who's humble who comes to the lord just like a baby does to their mom and just completely dependent upon the lord for everything those are the people that god will reveal his truth and give further revelation to must come to those who have honest hearts must understand that further revelation and understanding is the prerogative of the Son of God. He has absolute 100% control over this, not us. He says in uh, Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father, and neither knoweth <clears throat> any man the Father save the Son, and he to whom to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. You know, the Lord Jesus has a sole prerogative to who he wants to reveal the truth to. And so we should seek our live our lives in such a way that please him so that he would want to reveal truth to us. And it's an interesting truth as we study the scriptures that individual people and entire nations that continually reject God, they're actually given over or smitten with a blindness, an inability to perceive or understand. You know, that's actually what it means to be reprobate in, in Romans chapter 1, where it talks about being given over to a reprobate mind. It is a mind that is incapable of sound judgment. And this is exactly what is happening today with, you know, these uh, proponents of evolution and 
this LGBT stuff that's happening in my country. People are actually given over to a mind that is incapable of sound reason or sound logic. But it's because they uh, have put, they've tried to put God down. They've tried to uh, get away from God's ways and his understanding. And they think that they're smart. But God actually has the last laugh, if I could say that, because he's in control. He can smite people with blindness. The ability to understand and perceive is completely at his disposal. It is his prerogative. If we look in Romans chapter 1, I'm just going to pick a few verses here. Verse 21 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You know, this is happening in our universities in the United States of America today. Uh, men and women who think they're pretty smart to come up with these ideas that to prove that God doesn't exist or that we don't need God. It's just absolute foolishness. You look around you and you see the trees and the grass and the sun and the moon and the stars. All these things point to an incredibly intelligent designer and creator. But yet they want to put their heads in the sand and just say, no, this all came by just random acts of chance. Just absolute foolishness. They profess to be wise, but really they're fools. Verse 24, it goes on, wherefore God also gave them up. You know, because they were unthankful and they wanted to bring God down, God gives them up to uncleanness, to the lusts of their own hearts. Verse 26 repeats this idea. And for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. And this is an interesting uh, number of verses in Romans 1, but the idea here is that because men were unthankful and they tried to bring God down and make him like the image of animals. Therefore, God brings them down and gives them over to all these things. And it's terrible judgment, really. It's because of nations and people that reject God. God smites them with blindness an inability to understand, incapable of sound reason or sound judgment. And it's a judgment from God. So we want to live our lives in such a way that we please the Son of God. Amen. Isaiah 66, 4 uh, also continues this idea. It says, I will also choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. So God chooses delusion for people because they've chosen to walk away and do things their own way. The judgment of God. God purposefully hides truth from those who don't have an honest heart to seek him. It is only a worthy seeker that can discover the hidden treasures of his word. Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is a glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. You know what? We are all called to be kings and priests in the kingdom of God. But here's a quality of a king. The quality of a king is one who seeks out or searches out for truth, looks for truth. And this is very important. God hides things sometimes. As, um, those who seek will find. And those who keep knocking, the door gets open to them. But it's to those who are worthy, who have honest hearts, who are seeking him and looking for him, that he's going to reveal the truth it's a sad truth but a tr but it's it's incredible 
that a man can search for many years but can't find the truth unless God imparts his grace and opens his understanding. Paul talks about this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, where he's talking about a certain group of people in his day. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. He says, he's talking about a certain group of people, especially in the last days, these men who are lovers of themselves covetous, boasters, proud, blaspheming, disobedient parents. But in verse 7 it says that they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, you could spend many years studying and have degrees after your name and PhDs and master's degrees, but yet those don't guarantee that a person will find the truth because God hides it from those who are not worthy. He speaks in parables to those who don't have an honest heart, who really want to know him. You know, in the book of Job, Job went through a tremendous trial, and he had these friends that came to comfort him, though they turned out to be miserable comforters. But there was one man who was there who sat quiet, and he waited to the very end. His name was Elihu. He was the youngest of the group. But he waited to the end because in his mind the older men should have wisdom and the older men should be able to speak something that would help Job in his situation. But at the end of it all, they had nothing to say that was inspired from God. They all had their own ideas, their own opinions. You could even almost say like principles from the Bible, but they weren't inspired. At the right for the right time at the right moment it wasn't the quickened rhema from god and elihu says this in job 32 7 through 9 he says days should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom but there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the almighty giveth them understanding old men are not always wise neither do the aged always understand judgment you see, it must come, as he says here, from inspiration of the Almighty. It is he and he alone that can give us understanding of his ways, of his word. So we want to be those who are not only seekers of truth, but seekers of God and lovers of God and seek to please him in our lives and allow him to change and work in our hearts so that we would be a worthy seeker, that we could find the truth. Amen. God bless you. Uh, we'll come back next time. We'll continue on our next number five about imbalanced truth.